Good, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, everyone. This is uh, session 4A of Sazerac. Um, we're just going to wait another couple of minutes um, to give people time to come in, um, and then we'll get started with our first talk. Thanks. Okay, so let's get started. So yeah, this is session 4A uh, of Sazaric. Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope you had a good time earlier in the day. I was asleep, but <laughs> I will go back and watch those talks on YouTube later. Um, so we've got um, a series of talks uh, today, and I just want to remind you that all of the questions uh, should be posed in the Slack channel. Um, if you can put your question in the thread for each speaker, um, and then I'll uh, myself and Masami will select questions and we'll read them out and uh, you're welcome to keep asking questions throughout the rest of the conference and hopefully the speakers will get back to you. Um, and I want to especially encourage uh, early career researchers, students and postdocs to ask questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, and that's how we, we learn things. So I really encourage you to ask questions. Um, so we're going to get started with our first talk today, uh, which is by uh, Alexa Morales. Um, and Alexa couldn't be here this morning, but she's got a recorded version of her talk, um, which I'm going to share now. Um, and hopefully <laughs> this is going to work. Um, so if you just give me one second. Um, okay. Actually, will very quickly do i have to mute myself can i mute myself when i do this oh um, you can see how <laughs> will it work I, we'll, I find out. we'll find out <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i want you to hear me sniffing in the middle of this so all right i will uh start playing so this is alexa's talk i will mute myself if you can't hear me let me if you can't hear anything let me know and i'll unmute Hi, my name is Alexa Morales. I'm a recent undergraduate at Florida International University. I'm gonna be showcasing the work that I did with Dr. Charlotte Mason and others this past year on the evolution of the Lyman alpha luminosity function during reionization. After this talk, if anyone needs further details, please refer to the archive link that's posted up here. Okay, so uh, the first stars and galaxies not visible to us uh, we're surrounded by neutral hydrogen IgM bubbles that eventually reionize due to reionizing photons from stars in these galaxies. And although they're not visible to us, uh, they affect their surroundings and through the process of reionization, we can learn about the early stages of the universe. One of the main questions we ask is, how and when did these form? What are they made of? So to answer this question, we need to constrain when reionization happens. Reionization uh, shown here, which is currently uncertain, could tell us about properties of the first galaxies that could have possibly reionized the universe. Uh, the gray curves show us the best estimate of when reionization happened, given different observations. As an example, we can see that at about redshift seven to eight, 
the universe could be anywhere between zero to 80% neutral. Uh, the observations as well still have large uncertainties. And using what we know about reionization or the lack thereof, um, the more information obtained, the more these regions can shrink. And so uh, we need multiple independent ways to measure this timeline. And so using lyman alpha emission, we formed a model for the lyman alpha luminosity function and its evolution over a range of high redshifts. By understanding the lyman alpha emission detections, non-detections from lyman break galaxies, and the UV luminosity function during the process of reionization, which is all based off of Charlotte's 2018 paper, we modeled the evolution of the lyman alpha luminosity function at about redshift six for different neutral fractions and eventually other redshift values. And we can see how the neutral fraction effects observed by an alpha emission as the universe becomes increasingly ionized and thus less opaque. And so I'll be going into detail into how we develop each component of the model in the next few slides. But we ultimately concluded that the shape of the Lyman alpha luminosity function changes as it become, becomes ionized, as well as increases. And we can use this to compare and interpret observations made by others. And so uh, here we have an example of the observational Lyman alpha luminosity function taken from the Silver Rush surveys, where generally the luminosity function shows the number density of galaxies with a given luminosity or magnitude. And there will be many more of them in this talk. And so uh, moving backwards in time, you can clearly see that as redshift increases, the amount of galaxies observed declines. And so we ask, uh, how do we interpret these observations? What do they tell us about the evolution of galaxies and reionization? Uh, we know that there's fewer galaxies at higher redshifts, but how much of this evolution is through the decline of galaxies existing as we look back into higher redshifts or possibly also due to absorption during reionization? So to get more information from these observations, we can build a model that separates redshift and the neutral fraction. We can fix either parameter and see how the observations adjust to our model. And so uh, here we have our Lyman alpha luminosity function model taken from Max Franke's 2015 paper. Uh, we can predict the number density of Lyman alpha emitters by using the Lyman alpha probability dis distribution. Uh, which is the probability for a galaxy to have a certain Lyman alpha luminosity combined with the UV luminosity function model as functions of UV magnitude, neutral fraction, and redshift to model the Lyman alpha luminosity function. And this integral is then multiplied by a normalization constant f, which we determine by calibrating our observations. And so um, here we show the Lyman alpha luminosity versus its probability distribution for UV bright and faint galaxies. And this is where uh, the neutral fraction modeling comes in. So the Lyman alpha transmission impact, which describes the fraction of Lyman alpha flux that reaches the observer once it passes through the IGM, which can be seen as this uh, Patrick bubble image, is created by using simulations of Lyman alpha equivalent widths that are generated using an inhomogeneous randomization simulation we can simulate what these galaxies would look like as their Lyman alpha passes through these patchy regions. And as shown, when the neutral fraction is increased to a neutral environment for both UV bright and faint galaxies, the probability of there being uh, bright Lyman alpha galaxies becomes lower than in an ionized environment. Uh, and so here we have the UV magnitude range for UV bright and faint galaxies versus the expectation value of a Lyman alpha of the Lyman alpha luminosity, uh, which is shown in this uh, equation. Generally, we expect galaxies with brighter UV emission to have brighter Lyman alpha luminosity. And so we see that there's not much increase in the luminosity for bright galaxies. Uh, they exist in dense luminous regions of the universe where large amounts of Lyman alpha photons are transmitted regardless of the neutral fraction. UV faint galaxies which have a larger increase uh, typically exist in less dense IGM regions with fewer galaxies uh, that don't reionize until much later and are more neutral than the dense regions where bright galaxies live. Uh, we estimate our fudge factor F by maximizing our defined likelihood from our model at a redshift 5.7 and a neutral fraction of about zero 
correct uh, observations, uh, assuming it is after the occurrence of randomization. Uh, we remarkably attain a uh, value for f of 0 0.974, which is then used for all Lyman alpha luminosity functions at, at all redshifts and neutral fraction values. And with this fudge factor so close to one, uh, this means that the Lyman alpha luminosity distribution for Lyman break galaxies uh, describes the Lyman alpha emitters at a redshift plus six. And so now with all this background information explained, I present our predicted Lyman alpha luminosity function model and its comparison with observations. Okay, and so uh, using the observations previously shown, we plot our new model alongside these observations. And on the x-axis, we have the Lyman alpha luminosity, on the y, the number density of galaxies associated with those luminosity values. Each model line corresponds to a different neutral fraction, and we view this model at each particular redshift where the observations were obtained. At any redshift, uh, the luminosity function doesn't evolve strongly enough uh, for neutral fraction values less than 40%, meaning that it really isn't a sensitive tool for the end of randomization. But we do see that it is consistent uh, with observations less than equal to redshift 6.6. When shifting from redshift 6.6 to 7.3 at about 40% neutrality, we see a drop in the model in terms of the neutral fraction uh, and the observations fit along a more neutral IGM. Overall, though, uh, we do see an increase in the Lyman alpha luminosity function with redshift. Uh, this is confirmed by observations. So once we created our model uh, for the Lyman alpha luminosity function at any given redshift or neutral fraction value, we use best fit Schechter function models across a range of high redshifts five to 10 to see the trends in each parameter for a zero to 100% neutral IGM environment. And we see that alpha increases as the universe becomes more ionized. This is the same for L star and phi star. Any wiggles that are seen in the plots can be caused by redshift. Alpha, which is um, the power law faint and slow parameter of the, of the luminosity function, shows an overall decreasing trend as redshift increases we see alpha decreases more significantly due to the neutral gas than it does with redshift uh, because this Lyman alpha attenuation affects faint galaxies more, making them fainter and forcing them further back into the Lyman alpha luminosity function. Uh, L star, which is the characteristic luminosity, is shown to decrease at a redshift five to seven and then increases at redshift eight. This is possibly due to the UV luminosity function evolution and its model for the dust inside of galaxies at that redshift. A reduction in the dust obscuration where younger, brighter galaxies at higher redshifts uh, contain less dust gives the possibility of observing them and uh, shifts the luminosity function model towards higher luminosities. Uh, phi star, which is the normalization point, decreases overall. Uh, so here we have our reionization history timeline updated with our new values. Uh, once we established our model, uh, we decided to determine the evolution of the neutral fraction using the Bayesian approach. Uh, similar to finding the likelihood for the fudge factor, we use Chalet's split norm likelihood equation for each luminosity function bin and a uniform prior um, in neutral fraction. We find that the Lyman alpha observations prefer later and rapid reionization that is consistent within two sigma confidence intervals with other observations at similar redshifts. These values can be seen on the timeline as the red points. Uh, we make predictions for these surveys. Uh, we, we plot our model Lyman alpha luminosity function and the approximate median neutral fraction value based on the reionization history allowed by the CMB optical depth and the dark pixel fraction at each redshift, also based on Charlotte's 2019 paper uh, between redshifts six to 10, shown as the gray shaded regions in our reionization history plot. Uh, we see that these surveys uh, will be able to detect Lyman alpha uh, emitters at high redshifts. To summarize, um, the evolving shape of the Lyman alpha luminosity function can provide more information about the IGM state Ultimately, we can use this information about the evolving shape to learn about the timeline of reionization and the evolving neutral fraction.
uh, with our model for the line monopoly luminosity function and its fit alongside observations, we can constrain the timeline of reionization further and provide evidence for a late and fairly rapid reionization uh, that's consistent with others' approaches. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present my work here for you all. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to message me through Slack or to send me an email noted here at the bottom. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Alexa. So as a reminder, Alexa wasn't able to be here uh, today, but if you have questions, uh, please post them in the Slack and she'll be able to answer them later. Uh, so our next talk is going to be by Guido roberts Bolsani. So Guido, if you want to get your slides set up. Uh, yeah, sure. Let me see if I can get this right. Um, if I do that, can you see the, the slides? Yeah, that looks good. Is that the main one or is that the presenter view? Uh, this is the main one. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go whenever suits. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Guido. Uh, okay, so hello, everybody. Um, my name is Guido Roberts Borsani. I'm a postdoc uh, at UCLA uh, working in the group of Tommaso Tru, uh on um, especially high um, redshift galaxies uh, with HST, ground-based um, spectroscopy with Keck, and also preparing for uh, Tommaso's JWST ERS uh, program. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today. My talk today is going to be on uh, one of the largest searches to date uh, for luminous redshift greater than eight galaxies with HST uh, using uh, pure parallel um, observations. Uh, the paper has recently been posted to the archive. I've also posted it onto the Slack channel. So if you're at all interested, please feel free to have a look. So why are we interested in redshift greater than eight galaxies and in particular uh, luminous galaxies? Well, the study of high redshift allows us to characterize the last phase transition of the universe and try and understand why it went from a neutral state to uh, an ionized state. Uh, and bright galaxies form a crucial component um, for regulating the overall shape of the UV luminosity function. So they are especially valuable. Um, these are some of the highest redshift confirmed sources that we know of uh, at redshift greater than eight. They're especially rare and you need uh, especially large volumes to try and search for them. So these luminous galaxies are you know, very, very valuable and they also form ideal targets for follow-up spectroscopy. Uh, so however, there's a little bit of a caveat and most large and deep surveys uh, that uh, try to look for these bright high redshift galaxies typically make use of single pointing observations, which can be um, affected and plagued by cosmic variance effects. You don't know whether these regions are representative or whether they might be um, characterizing particular under densities or over densities. And this is kind of highlighted by this nice plot by Brant Robertson, um, where you see various survey sizes uh, in the cosmological, a cosmologically simulated volume at redshift seven or so. And if you pick uh, this particular region over here, you can see this uh, sort of good simulated region. If you place it in one part of the simulation, you might see an over density, but if you place it in another, you might see an under density. And so you don't really know whether these pointings uh, are representative or not. Uh, and for comparison, that's what one HST pointing looks like. So in this talk, uh, partially introducing the Superborg survey, uh, this is a compilation of extragalactic HST with C3 uh, pure parallel surveys, um, uh, where the imaging has been homogeneously reduced uh, with a new and improved uh, pipeline. Um, the, this compilation of data sets includes all of the Borg cycles, uh, Hippies, COS, GTO, Clash, and Relics as well. And this gives then a total of 316 uh, independent sight lines, which have been consistently reduced. This is shown in the top part of the plot on the right. This is from Morishita uh, 2021. Uh, Takahiro Morishita is the one who compiled this data set and reduced it. So I encourage you to go look at his paper if you're interested. Uh, and the plot at the bottom here on the right shows the typical five sigma 
limiting magnitude. So you can go, you can see for H band, this is for H band, uh, we go down to 26.5 roughly and even lower down to 27 for some fields. So we use a subset of this data set to search for redshift greater than eight galaxies. In total, the combined data set affords 288 independent fields or roughly uh, 0.35 square degrees, or if you want it in other units, uh, close to 1300 arc minutes squared. The plot on the left uh, compares this uh, to other HST surveys that have been used to date. And this is one of the largest ones. It's about 1.4 times larger uh, than the combined candles plus ERS fields. And on the right, you can see the different bands that we have available to us over the, at least 75% of those uh, 288 fields. Um, and so you can see these are all, uh, this is all deep imaging in the near infrared, uh, crucially with these Y band filters and J band filters needed to uh, characterize galaxies at redshifts greater than eight, as well as optical filters to ensure that you have uh, non detections, blue wood of the Lyman break, and ensure that these are truly uh, high redshift galaxies. We also have Spitzer IRAC imaging over roughly 50%. Uh, of the data sets, and this goes a long way towards ensuring that these aren't low redshift uh, interlopers. So we apply um, near infrared color cuts, um, as well as a visual inspection to the entire uh, photometric data set. These uh, color cuts are fairly standard, uh, and I refer you to the uh, paper um, to get more detail. And we get something on the order of about um, 120 candidates in total between redshifts eight to 10. Uh, in total, it's 99 candidates at redshift eight, 14 at redshift nine, and 17 at redshift 10. These are dropout selected only. Uh, so we go one step further to try and uh, pinpoint their uh, redshifts through precise photometric redshift fitting with EASY. We also use the simulated uh, prior for this, uh, and this reduces the sample uh, down to about 49 galaxies. And over here on the left, you can see the distribution of their photometric redshifts. And on the right, you can see the distribution of their H-band magnitudes. Um, and because uh, we allow um, a large uh, parameter space for easy to simulate the Lyman break, it does mean that redwood of about 1.6 microns, the SED is completely unconstrained. And so we go one step further to try and simulate realistic star formation histories with the SED fitting code bagpipes. And this is just one illustration of what uh, one of our sources looks like, where you can see the photometric data sets, including the IRAC bands and the best fit SED with which we, <coughs> with which we uh, try to uh, measure the galaxy properties. Uh, so I've, I've got to speed through, uh, I think, but um, over 44 unique fields, uh, we look, we see 38 redshift eight galaxies, seven redshift nine, uh, and four redshift 10 and above galaxies. And these are just examples of the postage stamps that you can see, as well as the SCD fits. So now with uh, our sample in mind, we go ahead to try and characterize their rest frame UV properties. Uh, on the left here, you can see the absolute magnitude and UV continuum slope as, of, um, uh, as well with redshift. We don't find any significant trend uh, between these. Uh, but we do compare to other sources in the literature. And we also look at the galaxy sizes, both at the bright end, with, this is a plot on the bottom right that you can see. Uh, on the y-axis is the galaxy size in log units. On the bottom is MEV and redshift. And we compare this to data that been accumulated over wide fields as well as lensing clusters, such as the frontier fields. And you can clearly see the size uh, magnitude relation at redshift greater than six, where massive galaxies have uh, sizes close to roughly one kiloparsec and less massive galaxies, sub-kiloparsec uh, sizes. Uh, because we have Spitzer, we also go ahead and look at the rest frame optical galaxy properties. Uh, this is what you can see in this plot here. There are six different ones, stellar masses, specific uh, star formation rates, stellar ages, ionization parameters, metallicities, and dust contents. And over here on the right, I'm showing you roughly the range that we probe. These are all considered so-called normal uh, ranges uh, of representative galaxies at redshift greater than eight. Uh, we also make use of uh, the unique pure parallel uh, nature of our data set, which uh, means that um, 
cosmic variance effects are minimized because all of these sight lines are independent. And so we try and perform uh, an interesting little test. Um, when you look at the, star the cosmic star formation rate density, typically this is derived using a luminosity function and converting that luminosity function to a star formation rate density using an assumed conversion factor. However, this conversion factor is not, has not necessarily been tested and has been calibrated at lower redshift. Uh, and so what we do this time is we use detailed simulations uh, of completeness to estimate the uh, effective volume of our sources, as well as the star formation rates that we estimated with bagpipes to try and derive the star formation rate density of our sources in three different uh, magnitude bins and three different redshifts. And we compare this to values derived with luminosity functions. Uh, in general, we find these are consistent. Uh, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, more, but we find the differences between luminosity function derived values and our ones um, are no larger than uh, luminosity function uh, differences between the luminosity functions themselves. And so this conversion factor does not appear to be um, uh, um, a sticking point, let's say, uh, for the most luminous galaxies. Uh, and uh, discussions about the luminosity function constraints and densities of these galaxies is going to be presented in a forthcoming paper. Um, Leto Chawalit et al, 2021. So keep an eye out for that paper. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna fly through this a little bit, but what about representative follow-up with JWST? Uh, NearCam is already gonna go a long way uh, to improving galaxy constraints, um, just with medium band, for instance, which you can see here on the plot on the left. These are wide band filters at the bottom with galaxy SCDs and medium bands at the top, which better straddle um, galaxy SCD properties such as nebular line emissions or continuum. And this can improve uh, stellar age and stellar mass estimates by roughly up to 0.5 dex or so already. However, the power of uh, JWST really is gonna be in its near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, and I was very pleased to wake up uh, one morning to find out that uh, my cycle one proposal had been accepted to uh, study 10 of these redshift eight to nine superboard galaxies with near spec prism. We have 25.1 hours. Um, this is gonna be with um, uh, near spec fixed slit and MOS. And so we're gonna be able to observe the full rest frame UV and also the majority of the rest frame optical spectrum at greater than five sigma in only 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, so this is gonna be great because we can infer then um, the uh, intrinsic properties of the galaxies and get their redshifts without being dependent on Lyman alpha. But because we get the Lyman alpha region as well, we cover the full rest frame UV um, uh, spectrum. We'll also be able to link these intrinsic properties to the uh, opacity of the IgM. Um, and I refer to other talks that have been given before for comparison. Uh, and I think I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna leave my summary and conclusions over here that we conduct one of the largest searches for redshift greater than eight galaxies with HST finding nearly 50 candidates between redshifts eight to 12. Uh, and we use um, this large sample to derive galaxy properties and test assumptions prior to observing some of these with JWST cycle one observations. Uh, and so I leave it there. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, so there's some questions coming in. Okay, so the, uh, the first question from the other uh, Chana, uh, very quick. So how do you calculate your UV slopes? Uh, so the UV slopes are derived directly um, from the best fit SED with bagpipes. Um, the idea was because we probed various redshifts, we wanted to be able to consistently compare the UV slopes. Uh, this is not possible with the photometry alone, given that at redshift sort of, you know, 10 and above, you maybe have a single point, whilst at redshift eight, you might have several detections of the continuum slope. So this is derived directly from the SED uh, and the same for the absolute magnitudes. Okay, I think we have time for just uh, one more question, but there's more questions in the start, Guido, that you can answer afterwards. But so I'm gonna ask this question from uh, Rebecca Bowler, who asks, uh, how do the number densities of your brightest uh, redshift greater than eight sources compare to ground-based searches um, over several square degrees, e.g. Uh, Ultra Vista? Uh, I haven't, um, so that's gonna be uh, compared by Nietzsche's paper. Uh, however, 
Um, there are significant differences as well, but this is somewhat to be expected. Ground-based data are typically much shallower than the data we use by up to one to 2.5 magnitudes or so. And whilst the area um, afforded by the ground-based data might be significantly larger, these are also likely to be plagued by cosmic variance effects, given that these are just single pointing uh, areas, which is not the case for our data set and is really the strength of the Superborg data set that you know, 316 independent sight lines mean we can minimize cosmic variance effects. Um, and so I would argue that the ground-based data are more likely to select um, um, sort of the extreme end of, of the, the, the bright end of the luminosity function, uh, but we need to be careful in comparing data sets because they need to be first uniformly matched in depth uh, and, and area. Okay, thank you. So yeah, there's more questions thanks. in the stack if you're able to answer. Uh, All right, those, I'll, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I'll have very a cup of coffee report. and yeah, a cup of coffee, and then I'll, I'll answer them. <laughs> you thanks. take your time. Um, yeah, All right. So our, our next question, our oh, next question, our next uh, talk is from uh, Nicola Laporte. So if you want to get your slides up, yep, that looks great. Um, so take it away, Nicola. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizer to give me this uh, opportunity to talk at this very nice uh, conference. Today, I'm going to focus on the result from my uh, last uh, paper. And you have here the, the archive number on this first slide. You also have the name of the main people involved in this, in this project. And the main goal of this project was to probe cosmic dawn by observing the most distant galaxies. So here I'm showing you um, uh, pictures. We are all familiar with these pictures, summarizing the history of our universe. And I'm mostly interested by this period, which, um, which, which happened 300 million years after the Big Bang. That's the formation of the first galaxy, typically that's cosmic dawn. So that's just before the epoch of uh, rayonization. So how can we prop cosmic dawn with the most distant galaxies? Well, I think you have two different approaches. You have the direct approach where you can use the deepest data you have and try to see how far you can go in redshift and still detect galaxies. Uh, so we can do that typically with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we had just before a very nice talk by Guido uh, trying to search for a galaxy at Redshift um, up to Redshift 12, because that's the, the, the Hubble Space Telescope limit. I'm not going to discuss this uh, approach. I will focus on the indirect approach, which is um, if we search for extremely distant galaxy and we try to determine the age of this distant galaxy. And with that, you will be able to push back in time the formation of the first galaxy. But to do that, you need to answer three questions. First, do we have good age indicators at very high redshift? Secondly, um, can we measure the age of all the galaxies at very high redshift? And then, do we have any good example of galaxy with an old stellar population at a redshift above eight, for example? So, first of all, I would like to give you my definition of the age of a galaxy, and I'm sure that my definition will be completely different from the definition of a terrorist or, of, um, or people working on simulation. So my definition of the edge of the galaxy is the period during which a galaxy is forming stars. And do we have age, good age indicators? I would say that we have at least two age indicators. First, we can use the dust content of high redshift galaxy, because if you can estimate the amount of dust you have in a galaxy, and if you assume uh, some dust production rate by, by stars, you can get a first estimate of the age of a galaxy. I'm not going to discuss this during this talk. I will focus on uh, the, the other age indicator, which is um, the constraint on, of the size of the Balmer break. And as you can see here, you have a plot showing you the evolution of the Balmer break as a function of the age of the stellar population. And as you can see, if you increase the age of the stellar population, you also increase the size of your Balmer break. So the good point is that at redshift above eight, this Balmer break is seen between the two first IRAC channels, so between 3.6 and 4.5 microns. But as we know, um, at very high redshift, we can see break, not due to stellar continuum, but due to strong emission line. And this is what you can see here. For example, in this galaxy there, you see that you have a break at between 3.6 and 4.5 micron, but this break is due to strong emission line. And this is summarized in this plot where you have as a function of redshift, the uh, speeds are colors. And as you can see at redshift above seven, so we are in uh, situation number two, so somewhere here, we have strong emission lines such as oxygen three and H beta in the 4.5 micron channel. So if you want to be free from contamination by strong emission line, you need to search for object at a 
redshift above nine, so to be in that situation, number three, somewhere here. Um, so that's the selection. That's one of the selection criteria we use to um, to identify galaxy with an old with an old stellar population. So first we look for bright object, relatively bright object with an H band magnitude less than twenty six point five AB. We ask for a relatively large um, um, IRAC colors, so at least 0.5 magnitude, and of course a photometric redshift above redshift nine point one. We search for galaxies uh, in the Candles Ultra Vista and Frontier Field Survey. And now we should ask ourselves the question, is the Balmer break a good age indicator? And to answer this question, I would like to show you this plot, where you have um, the evolution of the Spitzer colors, so 3.6 minus 4.5 micron, as a function of the reddening, so typically of the dust content of a galaxy. Because as we know, the Balmer break can be um, um, influenced, let's say, by the dust content of a galaxy. So if we ask for at least 0.5 magnitude for the, for the Balmer break, and if we remove all the old stellar population solution, the color bar here is typically the age of your stellar population. Um, so you see that if we remove all the old stellar population, let's say all the solution with an age larger than 20 mega year, then we need, to, um, we need a reddening of at least 1.7 magnitude, which is a huge um, reddening at high redshift. And so far, we don't have any evidence that, uh, that in these galaxies at very high redshift, redshift 8, 9, 10, that these galaxies host a huge amount of dust. We have some examples of galaxies with dust, but this is not the global properties of the population at very high redshift. So I think at very high redshift, constraining the size of the Balmer break is a good method to determine the age of, of a galaxy. So here you have the sample we selected. So this is six objects. We use one of these subjects, this one, GD1, um, nearly three years ago as a pilot program. Uh, and to try to, to identify if the break we can see between 3.6 and 4.5 micron is due to an old stellar population. And as you know, we, we identified, we, we detected oxygen 3, 88 micron with ALMA, Lyme and alpha with the VLT. And by doing some SED fitting, we can, we can demonstrate that the break we have here is due to the old stellar population. So of course, after this result, we ask ourselves, is this subject um, uh, a representative of the general population, or is it just an outlier? So to try to answer this question, first we use simulation, and we work with, this is the work we did, we, we, we did with Ali Katz. So we use a small box, uh, something like 70 commoving megaparsec cube, and within this small box, we identify three objects, like uh, the one at redshift 9.11 I just discussed. So it means that these objects are not rare, and we should search for uh, this object uh, in, 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 this, in, in, in all the survey we have. So that's why we combine 70 hours of telescope time, combining data from all the telescopes you have on this slide. Why do we need to uh, do some spectroscopic follow-up? Because we want to know, to measure precisely the redshift of our galaxy. Because if the redshift is below, is below nine, then that would be complicated to claim that the break we see is due to the continuum and not to contamination by emission line. So we combine data from the VLT, from um, Keck, Mosfire, from Gemini, and from ALMA. And I'm going now to show you the results. Um, so the first result is from ALMA. Here I'm showing you the detection of, of an emission line here um, that we believe is oxygen-3 at 88 micron at a redshift of 9.28. So this is completely consistent with the photometric redshift. Um, so here you have the 1D spectra, and here you have the shape of the line. We can't see any evidence for um, a rotation for this line. Here you have the plot showing you the signal to noise, the pixel signal to noise ratio distribution, where a peak here at signal to noise ratio of six, which is uh, consistent with our detection. Here you have the result from our near infrared spectroscopic campaign looking for Lyman alpha and other emission lines. And as you can see, we have um, very few success. We have no detection for the object for which we detect oxygen 3 at redshift 9.28 nothing in the ultra vista object and maybe a faint detection uh, in one of the goods north object but for the rest of the talk i will consider this subject as a non-detection but we have a detection at least in these subjects in in goods north at a redshift 8.8 .8. Okay, so if I combine all these data, I'm going now to the, to the conclusion of this work. The first conclusion is the uh, fraction of detected Lyman alpha as a function of redshift, because as you know, when we enter into the epoch of ionization, so at redshift above six, we should have a strong decrease in the uh, number of detected Lyman alpha. But if we consider just our object, our sample, 
And I, I, I agree with you, our sample is BS because we are just looking for objects with evidence for an old stellar population. The detected fraction of Lyman alpha is not zero, is uh, let's say something like 40%. Right with huge error bars, uh, so I think this result supports um, the hypothesis of an old stellar population in all these subjects. Conclusion number two is the formation redshift for all these galaxies, for the six galaxies in our sample. So we use bagpipes, we did some SAD fitting um, using uh, several realistic star formation history. Here you have the list of the star formation history we use. I'm not going to enter into detail. Here you have an example of SAD fitting. And as you can see here, we can see uh, the band break, or at least that's the solution uh, preferred by the, the SAD fitting work. And all these galaxies have a formation redshift above 15. Right, and you can also look at the last column here, which is the fraction of mass formed in this galaxy at a redshift above 10. And as you can see, 70% of the mass in most of the galaxy is formed at a redshift of 10. So now the third conclusion of this work is that you can take the star formation history of your object, convert the star, convert the star formation history into UV luminosity, and demonstrate it that these galaxies, the progenitors, let's say, of these galaxies, will be easily detected by the James Webb Space Telescope. Here I'm showing you the uh, near cam sensitivity. This is in three hours, the five, the five sigma sensitivity. And as you can see, we will detect easily all these objects. And the last conclusion from this work is um, when you try to uh, study the evolution of the mass fraction as a function of redshift to this to try to distinguish between the two evolution we have um, the debate we have in the evolution of the star formation rate density do we have a smooth decline or do we have a rapid decline of the star formation rate density and of course this will give you different evolution from for the mass fraction evolution and as you can see here that's the red curves uh, you have there we are um, let's say um, more um, consistent with the rapid decline. This is what you have you have there. Um, so I think I have no time to discuss this, but um, if we have evidence for Palmer break in galaxy at redshift above nine, then it means we should have Palmer break or all stellar population in galaxy at redshift below nine. And this is a work done by uh, Guido Robes Barsani. I, I encourage you to read the paper where we show that um, if we combine HST, Spitzer, and ALMA data, we are able to identify this Palmer break in, uh, in galaxy at redshift uh, below. Uh, below nine. And I think I'm running out of time. So I leave you with my conclusion and I'm taking question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, so if we'll just wait um, a few uh, seconds for some questions to come in. So a reminder, you can post your questions um, to Nicola in Slack um, and especially encourage uh, early career researchers to, to ask questions. Right, we got the first question from Rohan Naidu. So could you elaborate on your argument about how Lyman alpha detections, non-detection support the stellar population being old? True. Um, well, the idea is just to say that if we are at redshift, let's say nine or 10, and if we detect Lyman alpha, it just mean that um, the galaxy at time to ionize the natural hydrogen in, uh, in its surrounding, right? So um, it, this is the argument. If you can detect Lyman alpha, you just, uh, it just means that the galaxy at time to ionize uh, the, the, the natural hydrogen in its surrounding. That's it. So if you can detect Lyman alpha in such high redshift object, that's one hypothesis. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question from Justin Spilker. So uh, he asks, how worried are you about uh, potentially non-uniformly distributed dust? Uh, for example, could clumpy dust produce the red SEDs and, and limit the Balmer break, but remain undetected by ALMA? Yeah, um, that, that's a good point, uh, actually. But when we stack, I think I've read many, um, many studies where you have people stacking um, the ALMA detection or the, the, the ALMA continuum, and they still detect nothing. And I think if you have, even if you have clumpy dust, you should see the dust in a stack uh, at redshift eight or nine, right? So th the idea will be that 
dust, I mean, that would be my, 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 my answer. Uh, we know that the, the amount of dust in high redshift in redshift eight, nine or 10 object is not sufficient to, um, to change or to influence the, 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 the shape of the band membrane. Like Shango, it's time to switch, maybe. Yeah, okay, so Nicola, there's uh, plenty more questions uh, in Slack for you to, to answer in your own time. Um, and we're going to move on to the next talk, uh, which is by uh, uh, Rachna Bartadeka. So Rachna, if you want to get your slides set up. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you see them? Uh, yeah, we can just, yeah, now it's good. Okay. Right, take it away, Rajna. Uh, can you also see my video because I can't see myself anymore? <laughs> I can see. Okay, that's fine. Then. <laughs> okay, uh, great. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rachna. I am a research fellow at uh, ISA Estek in the Netherlands. Uh, and in this very short talk today, I'm just uh, basically just going to touch upon the motivation behind studying the faintest galaxies uh, in the epoch of reionization. So, essentially, uh, how we can study them, uh, why we should study them, and how we can study them with current facilities before the launch of JWST. And uh, finally, share uh, some of our uh, latest results. That that recently got published in AMJ. So uh, starting with the very familiar schematic that shows the evolution of the universe, um, we know that epoch of reionization is an important phase change in the history of our universe. And we also know that this phase change must have started as early as redshift 20 and ended up about redshift six or so. But what we don't know is what these first energetic sources responsible for reionization are. Uh, are the galaxies, are the quasars, uh, are the pop three stars? And we also don't know when exactly they formed. Uh, and soon JWST will help us answer these very fundamental questions by looking for the first light objects in the redshift range of 10 to 15. Uh, but with HST, we have been able to discover galaxies up to redshift 11 well into the epoch of reionization. So uh, if you look at the literature, one can see, then, uh, see that there have been several studies with HST that uh, basically suggest that early star forming galaxies could well be the best candidates to drive reionization. Uh, and uh, so, for example, if you uh, 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 if you look at the luminosity function studied by Finkelstein et al. and Bowens et al. Uh, out to redshift eight and ten, you will see that uh, it revealed a very steep uh, faint and slope at these redshifts, uh, which uh, essentially means that there is a significant contribution from the faint galaxies. And also, if we look at, uh, for example, the stellar mass function studied by Song et al. Uh, it also shows that the mass function evolves with, uh, with time and it actually becomes, uh, becomes steeper with higher redshift, such that there are more low mass galaxies at higher redshift than at low redshift. And so the implication of these studies essentially is that the UV luminosity density responsible for reionization uh, is, uh, is dominated by faint galaxies. Uh, but the challenge, of course, uh, is that uh, these faint galaxies are beyond the detection limits of HST. And so if this idea of galaxy powered reionization has to work, uh, we need to integrate the luminosity function to an absolute magnitude of uh, around minus 13. Uh, but another problem is that simulations actually predict a turnover in luminosity function at some magnitudes greater than minus 17. So uh, should this happen, uh, firstly, it will present a challenge for our models of reionization. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, this turnover, if it exists, it lies beyond the reach of HST. Uh, as I said before, finding these distant galaxies will be a routine with JWST, but until then, the only way we, we can address this problem is by, uh, by combining uh, HST with lensing of massive clusters. And so for this very reason, the Hubble Frontier Fields Program was designed in which Hubble observed uh, these six massive clusters of galaxies as gravitational lenses, uh, along with six adjacent parallel blank fields. Uh, but the problem with galaxy clusters, of course, is that uh, these clusters are also home to these massive and bright uh, foreground galaxies, which, uh, which actually makes it extremely hard to see the pin objects. And so to solve this problem, uh, we developed a technique that accurately removes the most massive, uh, most massive foreground galaxies from the critical lines of the clusters, uh, because that's where the greatest magnification of distant objects occur. And uh, it's an iterative process, and uh, we remove these massive galaxies using Galapagos and Belfit. 
unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into the technical details of it, uh, but the method is explained in detail in our, in our uh, 2019 paper in case, uh, in case you are uh, interested. Uh, but as an example, on the, on the left is MAX0416 cluster uh, on which the subtraction procedure was applied. In the middle is the Galpit model of the galaxies, which were subtracted from the cluster. And on the right is the final subtracted image uh, in which you can see some of the faint sources that were basically uh, hiding behind these galaxies. And uh, so with this method combined with, uh, with lensing, uh, we were able to derive the very first error mass function for frontier fields program from redshift six to redshift nine. Uh, we used a acidic fitting method using imaging from HST, VLD and Spitzer uh, to estimate robust stellar masses of our IZ sample. Uh, demagnified them using all the available lensing models for frontier fields. And uh, then we fit a Schecter function to the data, which is shown by the solid green line here in these plots. A key result of this paper is that we were able to characterize the mass function to the lowest measured stellar masses for the first time in frontier fields, uh, 10 to the 6.8 solar mass. And our results also showed an apparent steepening of low mass and slope with increasing redshifts from uh, minus 1.98 at redshift 6 to minus 2.38 at redshift 9. Uh, and um, uh, these slopes are steeper than previous studies. And as you can see, we are uh, also not finding any evidence of a uh, mass function turnover in the mass range probe. Uh, recently, Furta et al. have observed a turnover uh, in their study, which is shown by these uh, red points here in this plot. Uh, but the turnover primarily is because uh, they derive their mass function by, uh, by convolving their uh, M star M U V relation uh, with the luminosity functions uh, uh, of Etek et al., who do find a turnover uh, in their luminosity functions, as I will show in the next slide. And so, um, with the same sample, we also derived the luminosity function and we were able to characterize it to magnitudes as, uh, as faint as minus 13.5. Uh, the faint and slopes of our luminosity function also showed an apparent steepening with increasing redshift. And uh, once again, we did not find any evidence of a turnover uh, that some, some studies like Bhuvan et al. and Etek et al. Uh, have found at an absolute magnitude of around, around minus 15, which is shown by these yellow and black points here in this plot. And so with our new measurements, we also estimated the UV luminosity density and stellar mass density. Um, and uh, as you can see uh, in this plot, these uh, orange circles, which represent the luminosity density, uh, which we have estimated by integrating our luminosity functions to an absolute magnitude of minus 13.5, uh, which is the faintest galaxy in our sample. Uh, they are quite high compared to the luminosity density estimated by uh, with magnitudes of minus 17, which is the uh, observational limit of HST. And uh, they also show a smooth decline towards higher redshifts in both the cases. Then uh, if you look at the plot of stellar mass density as a function of redshift, uh, what we uh, find is that uh, not only the stellar mass density has increased by a factor of uh, 15 from redshift 9 to redshift 6, uh, but there is also a surprisingly high amount of stellar mass density uh, for galaxies in the early universe up to redshift 9. And this uh, basically is an indication that uh, galaxies of masses around 10 to the 8 uh, have already formed a significant density by this time. And so what this tells us is that uh, the star formation and assembly history of galaxies is significant in the epochs of redshift greater than 9, which we cannot probe in detail until the launch of GWST. And uh, then very recently, uh, we also looked at the UV colors or UV spectral slope beta of our same sample of galaxies. Uh, once again, we estimated the UV colors using a uh, SED fitting method. And in this plot, we are first looking at the correlation between restroom UV and uh, uh, restroom UV and beta by plotting uh, median values of beta in uh, three different bins, which is shown by these black points uh, here in this plot. Uh, this correlation has also been looked into by several other studies. Uh, for example, uh, Bowen et al., these sand points here in these plots, uh, they uh, found the correlation between rest frame UV and beta, uh, such that uh, uh, faint galaxies have bluer UV slopes. Uh, but then there are also other studies, for example, from Finkelstein and Dunlop, who do not find uh, such correlation. Uh, but again, these studies are limited to an absolute magnitude of minus 17, uh, which is shown by these dashed blue lines here in these plots. Uh, and so with frontier fields, we are for the first time able to look at the UV colors of galaxies between minus 17 and minus 13. 
And the reason this is particularly exciting is because models actually predict that values of beta equals minus three do not appear uh, until magnitudes, magnitudes greater than minus 70. So should we detect such blue slopes uh, from these galaxies, um, we will potentially discover the very first evidence uh, for very low metallicity star formation in the early universe. Uh, but as you can see from these black points here in this plot, uh, we, are, uh, we are not finding any correlation um, at um, all redshifts we study. Uh, but interestingly, when we look at beta as a function of redshift, uh, what we find is that uh, these median values of beta, these orange circles, uh, they appear to evolve mildly from redshift six to redshift nine, uh, such that galaxies have lower values of beta at higher redshift. And uh, this uh, blue dotted line over here, uh, it, uh, it basically shows the UV colors uh, Sorry, it suggests the expected colors if galaxies had stars with very little metals. And so our results basically show that the UV colors of galaxies with frontier fields are not blue enough to have stars with very low metallicities. And only JWST will be able to provide a clear picture of this. Uh, but as of yet, there is no evidence for uh, exotic or top three star populations um, uh, at the highest redshift scope with frontier fields. Uh, and finally, uh, as I showed earlier, we do not find any correlation between rest from UV and beta, but we do observe a strong correlation between beta and stellar mass, such that uh, lower mass galaxies have uh, bluer UV slopes at all redshifts. Uh, this paper uh, recently got published in AppJ, in case you are uh, interested in having a look at these results in detail. Uh, but yeah, with that note, I'll just summarize my talk by, uh, by saying that uh, we have been able to characterize the mass function to very low masses for the first time in frontier fields. Uh, and we have also been able to characterize the luminosity function to magnitudes as faint as minus 13.5. Uh, then we have also observed an apparent steepening of uh, faint end slope and as well as low mass end slope uh, with increasing redshifts. But in the same cosmic time interval, we have found the lack of evidence of exotic or pop three stellar populations. And so these results basically do support the idea that uh, faint low mass galaxies in the early universe could have been responsible for reanalyzation. And they also clearly show the potential science that can be done with JWST, uh, which will provide a clear picture of uh, whether there exists any turnover in luminosity function and mass function, and uh, also on the presence of pop three stars. Uh, so uh, thank you thank very you much, much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks again. And yeah, if you uh, want to ask Rachel a question, you can please put that in the Slack uh, channel before A. And we'll just wait a few uh, seconds for questions to come in. Right, so got the first question. So how robust are your steeper luminosity function slopes without contamination? The length model, uncertainties, et cetera? Uh, sorry, Masami, can you repeat that? Uh, how robust are your steeper luminosity function slopes? Okay, lens model, uncertainties, et cetera? Yeah, uh, so basically, uh, uh, if I go back to the plot, um, Okay, I can't, I can't share my screen for some reason. But uh, the error bars uh, basically in the luminosity function, estimation of luminosity function and mass function, uh, we have accounted uh, the uh, photometric errors, the errors due to uh, stellar masses and luminosities and also uh, lensing maps. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we do have certainly included all these uncertainties while estimating these. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Ranshan. So I think in the interest of time, we're going to uh, have to move on to our next talk. But um, if people want to continue asking questions, please uh, do so in Slack. Uh, OK, great. John, you're ready. <laughs> so um, our next talk uh, is by John Weaver. Thank you. You are muted, though. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Weaver. I'm a final year PhD student at the Cosmic Dawn Center here at the University of Copenhagen supervised by Professor Suna Toft. I'm gonna to take a few moments of your time today to talk about beasts in the bubbles, measurement of the massive end, or should I say luminous end, of the redshift greater than eight UV luminosity function. I wanna thank the organizers for allowing me to, or giving me the opportunity to present this work today, and also to my collaborators without whom this work would surely not be possible. As many of you may know, the Cosmos 2020 uh, catalog is, is nearing completion, nearing uh, publication and release. It is a near infrared selected catalog of about a million galaxies over the two square degrees of the Cosmic Evolution Survey. Just to give you a sense of, of these images, on the right hand side, I show an RGB image of the near infrared bands, where you can just get a sense of the, the density of sources in these ground based images and also the diversity of, of galaxies and sources that we can find. Compared to Cosmos 2015, Cosmos 2020 reaches significantly deeper depths than most of our bands, notably in the optical bands, thanks to the HSC uh, SSP DR2 release, providing even deeper GRIZY um, uh, bands, which of course is important for removing low redshift interlopers from otherwise high redshift samples, and as well uh, increasing in depth in the near infrared bands, allowing us to have more mass complete samples and pushing that mass completeness to higher redshift. The catalog is constructed with two photometric codes. One is classic. This is basically the same strategy as in our previous catalog in 2015. It utilizes source extractor for source detection and photometry, and then uses IRAC clean, a PSF fitting uh, software to do the IRAC photometry. In contrast, we use a, a new tool called the Farmer um, which utilizes parametric models to fit sources using, uh, uh, so it's wrapped around the tractor, which is a software code written by Dustin Lang and David Hogg. Uh, the difference is that now flux and position are now full model parameters. This gives us sensitivity to ultra faint sources per and precise to blending. What I mean by that is on the right hand side, I show two galaxies that are very nearby as a pathological case where even two arc second apertures cannot hope to separate their fluxes. However, we see that by developing a model for these galaxies, we're able to uh, very easily and robustly uh, separate their fluxes to blend the sources. And then we can take these same models that we've derived on these higher resolution images and apply them to lower resolution images, such as IRAC, which is of course valuable for all of our high redshift rest frame optical science, where we can now get an even better idea about uh, the fluxes that we can measure there. Uh, the farmer also provides free fitting and residual statistics, shapes and sizes, um, which are of course useful as well. Each of the two photometric catalogs is paired both with two photometric redshift codes, LaFar and Easy. So on the right hand side, I show um, uh, the performance of the photo photometric redshifts on the Y axis versus the spectroscopic uh, redshifts on the X axis for the classic version on the top and then the farmer version on the bottom for four bins of magnitudes going from 17th to 27th magnitude with all the usual statistics. We find unprecedented photometric accuracy uh, between classic and the farmer uh, and the difference between the redshift codes is really uh, minimal. And so overall we achieve a, a sigma NMAT less than 1% on the bright end with a sigma NMAT less than 5% on the faint end with a low bias and low failure rate. And so importantly, we get uh, four photometric redshifts for all of our sources. And I note that for those of you uh, looking at this even more carefully, you'll see that the statistics are slightly better for the farmer on the faint end, which has implications for how we go about doing our high redshift science with the Cosmos 2020 catalog. So of course, in an audience like this, I don't need to convince anyone that uh, looking at larger co-moving volumes is important for our science. Uh, right, because environments dense enough to support the most massive galaxies are found only the largest and deepest surveys, which makes Cosmos 2020 over its two square degrees a valuable survey to look for in, er in order to understand the epoch of reionization. 
course, we'll get to the, the, the core of the matter here. I thank the previous speakers for doing such an excellent job of, of uh, providing all the background for this. So I can just jump right in. So we provide new constraints on the first ultra-luminous galaxies to the UV luminosity function. This is a paper um, by Olivier Kaufman, uh, which is in PREP. We find 31 galaxy candidates at a redshift greater than 7.5 over the 0.8 square degrees of the ultra-deep region of Cosmos 2020. We also find, importantly, new sources only found with the model-based photometry from the farmer. And this is because the apertures in the optical bands are crowded with yeah, neighboring blue sources, which force uh, a low redshift solution mistakenly. So just to give you a baseline, here's our redshift 8 UV luminosity function with the red point shown here. We know from all the, the previous discussions on, on HST-based uh, pencil beam survey based UV luminosity functions that we have, you know, this, this uh, shape on, or, you know, uh, the, the data on the uh, faint end. And of course, it is the largest surveys that are able to provide the range of environments in order to find these rare, massive, supposedly massive, luminous galaxies, which populate the, the bright end of the UV luminosity function. And so here at Redshift 8, we find excellent agreement with previous works, most notably those of Bowens, Bowler, and Stefanon. But now, we, of course, we can go further into Redshift 9, and we see that uh, we also agree with the work from uh, Bauer, Bowens, and Stefanon. No huge surprises there, especially seeing as this, the data sets are, are very similar. Uh, likewise, we find an excess of these bright uh, sources consistent with this previous work. And so we can, we can fall back on, on the usual discussion about this, right? Could this be that quenching has not begun yet? In other words, the halo quenching has not set in. And in fact, we're seeing uh, a parallel-like UV luminosity function, which would then betray the initial conditions of the halo mass function from which these galaxies, of course, uh, recently formed. Or uh, as many have, have posed, does dust complicate this picture? Is, is our dust recipes in inadequate? Do we not understand dust production at these redshifts? We also find no evolution of the UV luminosity function uh, normalization, uh, also at these uh, on the bright end, also in consistent with previous work. So here's redshift 10, for example, and you can see that the normalization didn't change. Um, we're getting basically the same number density as the sources as we go to higher redshift. And so if, if the star formation rate efficiency at redshift 10 is similar to that redshift 9, then of course we really shouldn't find such bright galaxies here. We'd want an increase with number density with time such that we can continue along with the rest of the narrative down to low redshifts. So of course this is surprising. And so while the lensing estimates are too weak in our redshift eight to nine bins to explain away uh, this overdensity and lack of evolution, we find that at redshift 10 with only two sources formally in that bin, uh, the lensing may indeed contribute uh, to, that, to that lack of evolution, in addition, of course, to contamination. It's two sources. Uh, shot noise, of course, is prevalent. Of course, how are we going to answer all these, all these problems? Well, as many of speakers have said before me, we're going to go to JWST. So we have a JWST Cycle 1 proposal, I'm delighted to say, or Cycle 1 program, I'm delighted to say, uh, which I am the PI of, that uh, will perform a detailed spectroscopic study of five ultra-robust, ultra-luminous galaxies selected from this UV luminosity function work. Of course, they won't be seen in smaller surveys due to the reasons I already illustrated. And we will use deep, uh, wide, greater than 26 uh, AB spatially resolved spectra from clear prism mode to characterize their mass assembly and star formation. For those of you who are unaware of, of integral field spectroscopy, we're going to take a source like, like this wonderful Redshift 7 galaxy from Ballarat 2018, and we're going to turn uh, the Redshift 9 version of it into a full-on data cube so we can study multiple sight lines across the galaxy spectroscopically for the first time. So I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up here. I want to mention briefly that um, part of a work, uh, part of a, a survey in progress called the Cosmic Dawn Survey. It's a 50 square degrees survey to map the high Redshift universe. Uh, importantly, it includes 20 square degrees of the Euclid deep field north and south, uh, and Euclid will then provide a deep near-infrared selection for the survey. Uh, optical imaging, GRIZ optical imaging, is already underway from the Hawaii 2.0 program with several papers in preparation, uh, which should be submitted uh, very soon. 
As well, this work, uh, this survey uh, is supported by the largest Spitzer mission ever at 6,000 hours. This is a Spitzer legacy survey. And again, that paper, Modetti et al., is also in prep. Just to give you a sense of scale, on the right-hand side is, is the uh, Euclid deep field north uh, compared to the Euclid field of view and also compared to candles, just to give a sense of, of difference of just the magnitude um, of the area of the survey. So this is a, a zoom in of the survey just to give you, just to motivate this whole model-based model -based photometric method and the reason why we need to keep developing tools to better understand crowded fields. And so the Cosmic Dawn survey will be a powerful resource for identifying large numbers of redshift galaxies and to, of course, understand the epoch of reionization. So I just want to uh, just finish up on this slide. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Uh, I'm on the job market this year. Please get in touch if you're interested in working together. You can find me on my email here or you can find me on Slack. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, and so if we just uh, wait a few uh, seconds for questions to come in on Slack. Right, so question from Rebecca Bowler. Um, so are the new sources you find that are close to low Z galaxies gravitationally lensed at all? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that, that exact detail. Very good question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say something that's not true. So I'll get back to you on that if that's okay. We have a question from Yuchi Harakani, um, who asks, uh, do these very bright galaxies at redshift greater than eight uh, significantly contribute to the star formation rate density at that epoch? We have not done those calculations yet. Again, this is the, the paper that's in prep is a pretty short work, just focusing on the UV luminosity function. It's also in prep. Um, so that's an excellent thing that we should definitely go out and do, and I hope we do that. Thank you. All right, so the next question is from the Sarah Bosman. Um, for the sources only selected through your improved deep landing, did you investigate how, why the sex tractor version of deep landing is failing? Yes, the, the sources, these are very small sources, a high redshift, of course. I don't think I need to justify that here, but that the uh, two arc second aperture can include multiple of these small sources. And so in, in all cases, visual inspection immediately reveals that the sources were, were deblended in, in the detection step but that when the aperture was performed, when the force photometry was performed on these bluer bands, uh, the neighboring or this, this neighboring source that was apparent uh, in, in that band shone through. And of course, this high redshift genuine source wasn't there in those blue bands. So yeah, it's entirely due to, to the fact that you just fundamentally can't separate this stuff out uh, with, with apertures right now. One more question, if you can answer it in under a minute. Sure. Um, so our, Yoro Mathe asks, are any of the redshift greater than eight sources spatially resolved uh, in the K-band? As far as I'm aware, no. Uh, these are all unresolved sources. And for sure, um, right, the, the farmer is able to provide shapes for these things, but only if they're, they're actually resolved sources, right? Because the, parameter, the, the parameters of effective radius and shape and whatnot are only going to be valid for sources that are resolved. And so the farmer's main job is to pick out which ones are resolved and which ones are not. And these are all, um, I'm sure, point source, uh, uh, point source uh, models, and point source um, uh, galaxies. And in fact, if we found it to be the converse, we found them to resolve sources, I think we'd be a lot more skeptical about them. So thanks. Uh, thanks very much, John. Um, you've got a couple more questions in the Slack, um, so you can go and take your time to respond to those. Great, thank um, you. Thank you. So our final talk um, of this session is from Adam Trapp. So Adam, if you want to get your slides up. Sure, thank you. Uh, let me make sure this is the right one. Uh, can you see this? Yeah. Awesome, right, we'll uh, great, away, well, Adam. awesome. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Trapp. I'm a fifth year PhD student at UCLA. And first I wanna say uh, thank you to the organizers and for the opportunity uh, to give a talk at CESREC today. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about a framework for simultaneously measuring uh, large scale environments and the galaxy luminosity function. And this is work that I've been doing uh, with Stephen Ferlinetto at UCLA. 
So I don't really need to explain to you all uh, why we care about the UV luminosity function. We've had some great talks today and, and throughout the conference. It reflects the, the growth of galaxies over cosmic time. And of course, JWST will measure the luminosity function at much earlier times and with greater accuracy than currently possible. Uh, but my talk title also mentioned environments. And so why do we care about measuring large scale survey environments and densities? Um, well, some of the other speakers kind of got ahead of me on this and I'm, I'm going to give my own take on why these are important. But first, let's talk about the effects of environments on the luminosity function. So survey environments differ because of large scale fluctuations in the underlying dark matter density field, as many of you know, an over dense volume will have more galaxies than average and under dense will have fewer. And this effect is called sample variance or cosmic variance. And uh, cosmic variance can be estimated via galaxy bias factor, uh, which I'm going to call epsilon CV for this talk, which represents a one sigma deviation from the average luminosity function. And it can be estimated uh, via theory, um, as we did last year, or it can be uh, in uh, simulations, as many people have done. Uh, and in short, a survey's environment can change the normalization and shape of its own local luminosity function. So let's take an example here. Uh, for a 100 square arc minute survey, uh, cosmic variance always dominates Poisson or shot noise at the faint end. That's these red curves. The solid is sample variance, cosmic variance versus uh, the, the Poisson variance here in the dashed. And it can dominate at the intermediate and bright end uh, up to pretty high red shift. These are the different um, areas. Uh, if you want to see the effects of cosmic variance on your survey volumes, I have a handy uh, Python package for you and there are others out there as well. So, so how, do we, how do we deal with this cosmic variance? Uh, in current works, cosmic variance is corrected for by fitting the shape of the luminosity function across fields. And then at the end, you normalize. And this method works well, but it has some drawbacks. First, the normalization of an individual field is ignored, so we can't leverage our knowledge of galaxy bias during the fitting, and we lose potentially useful information about the environments. Um, and the second thing is at higher redshift, cosmic variance affects the shape of the luminosity function more than at, at lower redshift. And by higher, I mean greater than six, the areas that JWST will be probing. Um, so this method can't address that. So our framework uh, fits the luminosity function and each field's density simultaneously. Basically we give each field its own conditional luminosity function. And what that means is it's the average luminosity function times a factor, which has to do with the galaxy bias function, which I mentioned earlier. And then this N value, which is the free parameter um, for each field. It's not really free, it has a normal function prior. Um, it's the number of sigmas off normal, you could, you could say. So for example, if we fit the Finkelstein, uh, sorry, Finkelstein data uh, from 2015 using this method to compare, let's see here, uh, we get similar constraints on the Schechter parameters at redshift six. Um, and then the note, this isn't the most recent luminosity function measurement as we've, as we've heard, uh, but this is the most recent one that I've gotten to reproducing so far. So we recover the same constraints on the Schechter parameters at redshift six and also at the other redshifts. So why am I giving this talk about this new framework if we get the same answer? Well, our method's main benefit is we get the posteriors on the dark matter densities of all the fields, right? So this is the posterior space. For example, the Goods North field, um, using our posteriors, they say that the uh, Goods North field would be as about one bias factor under dense. And the, goods, the uh, Hubble ultra deep field is about one bias factor over dense. Um, these, this is the N value, right? So the actual over densities depend on what that epsilon CV parameter, it can be between 10 and 40% um, depending on the location on the luminosity function because this uh, galaxy bias is a function of luminosity. And I wanna mention that I've added uh, Bowler 2015 data here because it helps with the bright end and uh, with the normalization. Okay, so we have these n values. Um, so let's go back to the question that I asked at the beginning is why do we care about the large scale densities? Uh, I probably don't need this slide uh, considering all the talks we've had about how important densities are, but I'll go over this. So the density provides info on the past and future of a region, whether it'll become a protocluster, its reionization history, et cetera. And it also allows us to check 
if we know what these densities are, we can check for environmental factors in galaxy evolution, like differences in the star formation histories between uh, an overdense region and underdense region. Also, um, as we've heard talks about, finding overdensities can assist in locating Lyman alpha emitters that are inside the earliest ionized bubbles. Uh, high redshift galaxy formation is strongly affected by large scale radiation backgrounds, which will be determined by the large scale density fields. For example, reionization will suppress the formation of small galaxies through photoheating, and identifying environments helps us understand these radiation fields and their feedbacks and their effects on the different parts of the luminosity function in the galaxy population. And finally, this isn't an exhaustive list, but uh, measuring survey environments provides a quantitative check on our understanding of galaxy clustering in the first place. All right. So an obvious downside to this is uh, now we have to fit for many more parameters, right? There's an n value that we have to fit for simultaneously for each one of the fields that we have. And that can be a lot of fields, but fortunately, the fields of environments are independent of one another. And also, crucially, we can combine multiple fields into a single survey with an effective galaxy bias function and a single n value to reduce the number of parameters. So for example, if you have a I don't know, a parallel program with 150 independent pointings uh, called panoramic, <laughs> we can combine those all into one effective survey, uh, one survey with an effective galaxy bias function and a single environment. Okay. Um, so I've been talking about using this method on current data, but we can also use this framework to predict how well JWST programs will measure the luminosity function and uh, simultaneously the environments of the individual fields. So I've taken a couple programs that we've all heard talks about this, uh, this week. Um, some are mosaic, some are parallel, and we make a very simple simulation of these surveys at redshift 6 to 12, drawing from the luminosity function in Finkelstein 2015 as the truth, and then we assign these fields random environments. Then we use our framework to fit the simulated data and obtain posteriors on the Schechter parameters and the environments, and then we compare the different surveys. And I want to give it another uh, highlight the fact that this is a very simul sim simple simulation. And the goal here is to get an idea how well these various surveys will combine and uh, complement each other to measure the UV luminosity function and the large scale environments. And so on this plot, I'm showing uh, basically <laughs> if you want to get the environment of a single volume, getting other volumes helps you in your knowledge of that first volume. So that can be shown here. So on this y-axis is the width of the posterior in determining the density, right? And the, uh, so for example, if you wanted to figure out what the density of the Jade's North environment is and you do the Sears survey and the Jade survey, you can get some constraints on what the environment is of the Jade's North environment. But if you add primer, you get a better determination of the Jade's North environment. And if you add panoramic, you do even better. Right. And so this is the reason that, that getting different sources is getting you more information on the first source is because you're fitting these all simultaneously and they help each other. Um, though you might notice that you're kind of getting diminishing returns, especially up at high redshift. And that's because once Poisson noise becomes about the same size as the density, uh, the change in density of your, of your uh, posterior here, you can't do much better. So there's sort of a Poisson noise floor to determining densities. Um, and this is just one example. Um, you can also do this. Here's the same thing, but for the Sears environment, and you could do this for all the different environments in any of these surveys that you're simultaneously measuring. And I also want to okay, uh, add that uh, I'll be adding Cosmos Web and WDEEP and Uncover uh, soon to these analyses. I think Cosmos Web is especially going to be helpful because it's really going to get the faint end, or sorry, the, the bright end with the, with the large, large, large volume. And uh, from there, I'm just going to say thank you for listening, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, so we'll just wait a few seconds for mm -hmm. the uh, questions to come in on Slack.
actually while people are thinking i might take mm -hmm. <laughs> opportunity to ask a question myself just on your last uh slide um mm -hmm. for these measurements of the the um the over density um the i would I, can you explain to me what the the error bars in those pots are coming oh. from because i guess i would yes. expect if you just use one survey you should have big they should be consistent with with each other within large error bars. Exactly. So if you if you just did this once, you make one set of fake data and you do the uh, analysis, you get a really jagged line here. Um, so because uh, the densities can be different and you can get different Poisson noise. Um, so what I've done is is done this multiple times. So I think this is uh, between five and twenty times, and you get this is showing the average, the sort of the the uh, average posterior widths that you'd get. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, yeah. Because the, the width is going to be some value if you just run it once. But if you run it multiple times, you'll get some, sometimes you'll do better at measuring the environment. Sometimes you'll do, you'll do worse. But I guess my question is that, that maybe mm -hmm. they're biased or so, because the, these are all had the same input. Um, um, each time we, we run it, we give it a different random seed. And so, for example, in one, maybe the Sears uh, environment is two sigma over dense. And the next time we run it, it's two sigma under dense. And so, because we want to, you know, maybe we got a really bad uh, draw on the random numbers of the environments um, between the different runs, if that makes sense. Okay. So this is sort of showing you the intrinsic uh, variation in what, how, how well you can do. Sometimes you will do uh, much worse and sometimes you will do much better depending on just what the random environments and the Poisson noise gives you. All right, so we got the, the first question from the Julia Munoz. So do you expect to get enough density measurements to be able to correlate them and learn some cosmology too? correlate them and learn some cosmology too. I, I'm assuming you're meaning uh, sort of, you get enough density measurements to sort of uh, re-inform what you know about galaxy clustering. And if that's the case, if not, I, you can clarify your question and I'll, and I'll answer it. But yeah, that would be great. That was, um, I guess one, one of my points is that you can do these measurements and you get the measurements of all these different environments. And then you can check and see if that's consistent with our understanding of how uh, halos cluster and how uh, galaxies in, in, uh, inhabit halos. Okay, um, there's a question from um, Naku Gangoli um, and he asks, um, I may have missed this, but how did you determine epsilon CV and would it depend on environmental factors? Um, yeah, so epsilon CV is, is the galaxy bias function. It's, the, uh, uh, it's been done uh, theoretically for a long time. Um, and we just recently uh, came up with a paper uh, giving our updated version of how you would calculate this galaxy bias function. So I can refer you to my paper. Um, and I can also talk to you more about it, perhaps in the Wonder Me session, if you'd like to come. But it's uh, as for its environmental factors, it depends on the redshift of the survey, the size of the survey, the shape of the survey, and of course the luminosity that you're looking at on the luminosity function. All right. So then the other question from Rick Momento. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit confused. So using multiple fields allows you to better estimate N for any one field. Is that because you assume N goes to unity with a very large set of fields? In other words, you've sampled enough that cosmic variance isn't relevant? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, I'll, maybe I'll give a little mini thought experiment here. If you take one measurement of uh, say one survey and you get really good data, you don't know what this n value is, right? Because you're trying, it's, it's degenerate with the phi value uh, of, of the average luminosity function. So you, by simultaneously fitting the average luminosity function 
um, you, you, you don't know what n is at all if you just have one survey. But if you take a second survey or multiple other surveys, basically those multiple other surveys are sort of doing the work and figuring out what the actual intrinsic normalization of the luminosity function is. And then so for the first survey, you, you can say, ah, well, this first survey has fewer numbers than the average, and so it must have a lower n value. It's not exactly how it works. It's all done simultaneously in the posterior fitting um, or the posterior generation. Um, but basically the other surveys acts as a sort of lever to tell you that uh, this survey is under dense or over dense. And the more other surveys you have, the better you can do for that first one. Okay. Thanks very much, Adam. And thank you very much to um, all of our speakers in the session today. Uh, so we're now gonna have a break and come back in 45 minutes. And if you want to uh, head over to the, the Wonder Me, um, some of us will be uh, joining there now. I'll be there in about five minutes myself. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing